Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones as they do interfere with the recording uh, system here as well. Uh, first item on the agenda is decision on taking business in private, uh, taking the agenda item seven in private. Uh, is it agreed by the committee? Yes. Thank you very much. Our second item is the Social Security Bill, and can I welcome Professor Gronya McKeever, uh, and thank you very much for rushing here. I know you had a very difficult time with the planes being delayed, so uh, thank you very much for getting here absolutely on time. We didn't have to change the agenda, <laughs> which we were trying to do earlier on. Uh, uh, Professor uh, McKeever is from Ulster University Law Clinic. Uh, you don't wish to make an opening statement, Professor McKeever, so we will just uh, go into questions, but first of all, I'd like to say when members considered who to invite to give uh, evidence on the bill, there was a distinct interest in looking at the experience of Northern Ireland. We had invited the Northern Ireland Government uh, Department to give evidence, but in the absence of, uh, unfortunately, a functioning government, they were unable to uh, participate today. So I hope, Professor McKeever, uh, we can rely on yourself to cover some of the ground, uh, to answer some of our questions, and there's no pressure there, obviously. Uh, so, Professor McKeever, I also believe that uh, you've been involved in research and in the area and also sit in the Social Security Advisory Committee. Uh, I may come in later on and ask you a few questions on that if you don't mind. But if I could start the questioning off, uh, just basically to ask you what you think uh, the lessons that we in Scotland with the Social Security Bill going forward can uh, learn, could learn or should learn uh, from the history of devolved Social Security in Ireland. So pass it over to you, Professor. So starting with an easy question then, um, I, think, I think the first thing to notice to note about uh, the devolved powers in so of Social Security in Northern Ireland is that they're fully devolved. So they are a different package of devolved powers than available in Scotland, uh, where there's a mixture of devolved and reserved powers. And the driver for um, devolution in Northern Ireland in Social Security terms is different than it is in Scotland. So it comes from a history of being, uh, powers being devolved in 1920, when there was a drive to maintain parity with the rest of the UK, and that was a, an ideological commitment by a unionist-dominated parliament at the time, and that maintained the, the system of social security in symmetry with, uh, in Northern Ireland with that of Great Britain. So the evolution of devolution in Northern Ireland has been very different from the Scottish experience, and while the political drivers in Northern Ireland are not the same uh, as they were, because we now, well, we sometimes have a power-sharing government, um, and so the ideological drivers are not quite the same. The reality is that devolutionary powers in Northern Ireland haven't been exercised to their full extent because of financial limitations. So the uh, immediate ambition to keep the Northern Ireland social security system the same as the rest of the UK meant that um, the Northern Ireland uh, executive had to meet the expenditure required to sustain um, particular contributory benefits. The difficulty in Northern Ireland was there were higher levels of unemployment and so more people drawing on the social insurance fund and fewer people paying into it. And that led to a state of potential bankruptcy for Northern Ireland um, in the early uh, 20th century. And so there had to be financial subvention from um, the Treasury. That meant that uh, in order to maintain parity, there were financial limitations and those are, the, those are the financial limitations that still apply and that really limit uh, ideologically and operationally the devolutionary um, differences that happen in Northern Ireland. So the lessons that, um, that I can bring from Northern Ireland are how you, how you might seek to manage uh, devolutionary powers within very tight fiscal constraints. So the ambition to do things very differently has to be tempered, of course, by the reality of what that's going to cost. Um, the lessons from Northern Ireland, I guess, are uh, <laughs> It has to come, part of it has to come around through intergovernmental agreement. Um, the package of reforms that I, th I think you'd probably be interested in uh, looking at for Northern Ireland are the supplementary payments, the mitigations package that has been agreed in relation to um, the welfare reform legislation of 2012, uh, which is for Northern Ireland 2015. That came about through um, a constitutional cliff edge, as, as so often is faced by Northern Ireland, where there was a political impasse and the government, the UK government agreed that um, devolved powers would be passed back to Westminster and in return there would be a mitigations package uh, 
agreed for Northern Ireland that would allow for additional payments to mitigate the worst impacts of welfare reform for Northern Ireland, recognising particular circumstances in Northern Ireland. Without that um, intergovernmental agreement, it's unlikely that the Northern Ireland Executive could have done uh, what it wished to do um, in terms of mitigation. So that's, I guess, the first lesson that um, the UK government involvement still remains critical. Um, and the second lesson, I guess, is just a more general one, that there have been operational variations in Northern Ireland, notwithstanding the drive for parity and the need to maintain symmetry. Um, and they are um, sometimes insignificant and sometimes more significant, and they relate as much to the administration of benefits and how that's handled the culture of administration as much as to the benefits themselves. And a lot of working around the edges, particularly in Social Security, and that's across the piece, not just in Northern Ireland, working around the edges can make quite a difference. So you can recognise exceptional needs in particular categories uh, of <coughs> claimants, for example. You can um, seek to, to have adjustments there, um, working around the edges to make sure that the operational delivery of benefits is improved. So even though the policy design is effectively the same, you might be able to change the outcome. And I think that's probably where Scotland is at at the moment, looking at the outcome of uh, the reforms that, that you're hoping to bring in as much as uh, how the policy delivery is going to be considered. Oh, thank you very much. So what you're basically seeing is although social security powers are devolved to Northern Ireland, exactly the same as what is in, in, from Westminster, Westminster actually operates these powers and tops up from the Westminster Treasury to Northern Ireland, or am I getting that wrong? Uh, Yes and no. Um, so in terms of the devolved powers, the devolved powers have always been fully devolved and the process in Northern Ireland has been that we do a karaoke version of the legislation from Britain. So we change the name to Northern Ireland and we change the bits and pieces within the legislation, but the, the face of the, of the legislation remains the same. The history of um, Social Security legislation passing through the Northern Ireland Assembly has been an expedited process. So there hasn't been very much scrutiny, um, in part because of political um, control over committees. So a unionist control committee is less likely to wish to scrutinise in detail um, because that might lead to differential outcomes or, or differences in the face of the bill, which might upset the objective of parity. Um, the main difference was the welfare reform legislation in 2012 that came to the floor of the Assembly that produced quite substantial political differences uh, and came at a time when there were other political issues at play in Northern Ireland. So the welfare reform legislation in 2012 started to divide parties along um, fairly traditional lines uh, and probably the welfare reform legislation acted as the lightning rod for a lot of other political issues that were going on at the time. And the only way to resolve that, that the legislation got defeated on the assembly. Uh, a petition of concern was raised in order to block the legislation from proceeding um, in May 2015. And the only way to get the legislation through was to get the assembly to agree to pass powers to, to um, put through the welfare reform legislation along with the welfare reform and work bill. It's a temporary measure. Um, there is a sunset clause on it, um, and, it, and there are some limitations over what um, Parliament in uh, Westminster can do. But overall, the devolved powers are now with the Northern Ireland Assembly, or would be with the Northern Ireland Assembly if it was operational at the moment. So the subvention, however, does continue to come from, from Treasury, and that really creates a disincentive um, to do things differently. So there's a bit of a heads I win, tails you lose situation. So if Northern Ireland creates a bespoke system that generates savings uh, in Social Security, those savings would be handed back to the Treasury. If Northern Ireland generated a bespoke system that um, costed extra money, that money would have to be found by the Northern Ireland Executive. So the financial incentive to change things is also limited by uh, not just the fiscal limits on, on what the Treasury will give, but on the outcomes of, of differences that might happen. Thank, thank you very much for, for that, Professor. Uh, Ruth McGuire, you wanted to come in? Thank you, thanks for being here. Um, Convener, if you indulge me, I think maybe we come to scrutiny later. Can I ask a different question about <laughs> cross-border? Just but based on what, what, what Grant had said, I just Stop wondered um, your opinion on who was best placed to take that kind of cross-border view of the, the interaction between new devolved and reserved powers and what your advice would be to ensure that um, the interaction between them didn't have unintended consequences. This, just to check the borders that I'm talking about, this is Scotland and yes. the rest of GB? Yeah. Okay. No, normally when I talk about borders, I talk about the Irish border, so yes. <laughs> it's a nice change. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, 
I think you're, really, you're talking about scrutiny um, from the start of the legislation right through to the implementation and the um, delivery. Um, my, view, my view is that there needs to be um, effective scrutiny of the regulations. Social Security regulations is where Social Security happens. So the primary legislation, um, I know some of the responses to the, to, the, um, to the bill have outlined that the legislation is quite bare, um, that there's very little detail on the face of the bill. That's becoming increasingly normal for Social Security legislation and the detail is fleshed out in regulation. So you need proper scrutiny of where the, where the regulations are happening um, and that would apply whether there was a border issue or not. The scrutiny process for regulations in, in the UK in relation to reserved benefits and, and in relation to devolved benefits in Northern Ireland is the Social Security Advisory Committee, which will not have a remit to scrutinise devolved uh, powers in Scotland, devolved legislation in Scotland. And so that does create a gap and in terms of who might be best placed, I mean, we could make the argument that the Social Security Advisory Committee would be best placed, but that's a, an argument that's, that's gone, that's lost. Um, the amendment to the um, Scotland Act took care of that very clearly. Um, my proposed arrangement would be that you would have a Social Security Advisory Committee type body for Scotland that would look at scrutinising devolved legislation in Scotland relating to Social Security, and that there would be some um, degree of uh, connection and coordination with the UK Social Security Advisory Committee so that there could be an oversight of where the overlaps were. And I think we're not going to know what those overlaps are at this stage. We don't know what the, the Scottish devolved legislation will look like, so we don't know where the gaps will happen, but we know that they will happen. Um, and I've proposed in a, in a piece um, uh, for the Journal of Social Security Law, I proposed three potential models. One is that, um, that you have a memorandum of understanding with um, the uh, DWP that would allow some scrutiny by um, the Social Security Advisory Committee in an advisory capacity rather than on a statutory basis to advise on um, devolved legislation uh, and then that, that, that would have a reciprocal um, arrangement presumably with um, a, an equivalent committee in Scotland. I'm not sure what the both governments' appetite for that would be. Um, the second issue might be to have cross-membership which I think would probably be the, uh, the most um, advantageous in terms of uh, being able to ensure that there was cross-fertilisation of the ideas there. But again, that would require um, intergovernmental agreement. So there's a model for that already. The Administrative Justice and Tribunals Council, now defunct, uh, had a main UK committee and it had Scottish and Welsh subcommittees, although sadly not a Northern Irish one. And that was able to take the issues from Scotland and bring them to the main committee and the issues from the main committee and bring them back to Scotland. So that you know, that model already exists. It would require, um, again, intergovernmental agreement because the, the joint membership would have to be agreed by both governments uh, or the overlapping members at any rate. Um, in the interim, the, the probably the most straightforward solution might be to have good working relationships between a Scottish and a UK advisory committee. And that would rely on good chair-to-chair -chair relations. It would rely on um, using the powers that already exist to invite presentations from Scotland creating powers for a new committee in Scotland to invite presentations from the main UK Social Security Advisory Committee to try and understand what the issues are for each committee and to work on cooperation and coordination where possible. Um, I think um, the Social Security Advisory Committee has good form on that and, I'm, and I have to stress I'm speaking as a member of the committee rather than as the voice of the committee. But the danger with that is that it falls foul or it falls victim to other um, statutory requirements. So the Social Security Advisory Committee, currently most of its work is done in scrutinising regulations for, um, for GB and Northern Ireland. That's the main bulk of the work. And if that work is substantial, then something else will have to give in order for that statutory commitment to be met. So there's, there's a danger there that that might not work as well in practice as you might hope. But it would be a good starting point to see what a future model would look like. So you could test what the cooperation arrangements should be like you could test to see what the extent of overlap was and the, and the need for that, because we don't at this stage really know what that need will be. But, but you're right to say that there are likely to be unintended consequences. There always are with, with Social Security legislation. And I think bringing geographical circumstances into an, a, a complex system of assessing need is likely to produce unintended, unforeseen consequences at this point. OK, thank you. Thanks. Alison Jones. You can be <coughs> Good morning, Professor McKeever. Your report on dignity and respect says a commitment to dignity and respect requires certain minimum standards and is an obstacle to the lowering of current standards. 
Um, so what I understand from that is minimum standards, both with regards to how someone is treated by the system, but also um, that, that those benefits should support a minimum standard of living are central to the idea of dignity and respect. Um, so I'd be interested to know how you feel that we can determine and then protect that <coughs> minimum standard, um, especially in terms of the amounts that are paid. Yes, uh, when we looked in the report, this is the report for the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission that um, I wrote with two colleagues, um, Mark Simpson, the lead author, and my um, other colleague, Professor Anne-Marie Gray, and we were asked to to try and figure out what dignity and respect would look like, um, particularly in legal terms, how you would embed that in a social security system. Dignity we could we could figure out because there are international human rights agreements that allow us to provide some conception of what dignity might look like. Respect in legal terms is very nebulous and so we didn't find anything that would allow us to define respect. But I think if you get dignity right and you get a culture right, you'll understand that, that respect will follow through on that. So when we looked at what dignity might involve, we looked at the international standards that already exist. Um, and I've, uh, in the briefing paper um, for this meeting, I've set out some of those um, standards. In particular, we would recommend that um, there would be a close look at the International Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights and the European Social Charter, both of which provide um, this idea of what a minimum income standard might look like. So very few international instruments will provide a monetary figure. And so that will be up to, uh, and understandably perhaps, because it's a, a question for each government, ex each executive to figure out for itself. Um, and it will differ depending on uh, you know, location and uh, time frame and everything else. So there's nothing really that guides us in terms of a minimum income standard uh, in the international human rights instruments. There are lots of, um, there's lots of work that's done uh, by Joseph Roundtree Foundation, for example, on minimum income standards and what looks like it's necessary to survive. But I think the value for those articles is that they don't just look to subsistence allowance, they don't look to an absolute definition of poverty, which is you have a roof over your head, you have enough food to eat. They go beyond that and they say there's a right to cultural and civic participation in society. So it's about living rather than existing and that's what protect, that, that is what provides the protection for dignity. So it's not just a matter of having enough to survive, but being able to actively engage in um, activities that other citizens take for granted, having a cup of coffee, going round for uh, a meal to someone's house. Um, and I think that would fit very well with the idea of a consensual definition of poverty that is um, led by a co-production model uh, in Scotland, which I think is becoming uh, clearer, th certainly through the responses to the bill, that the idea of a consensual level of poverty, uh, a model to measure that already exists, the poverty and social exclusion surveys <coughs> provide an indication of what um, members of the public think are basic elements for uh, everyday living and then you prioritise those and you identify that things like um, two good pairs of winter shoes or a suit for an interview or the ability to take your kids to the seaside for a week, those are things that people you know, now understand as part of daily living and that changes over time so 20 years ago nobody would have considered a mobile phone to be necessary but now the poverty and social exclusion survey says that is necessary so a monetary figure on its own um, won't necessarily give you the definition of digni dignity that I think um, would be best placed um, for the Scottish Government to look at in terms of the international conventions and the international human rights instruments. And our recommendation in the report was to embed uh, those international standards into a primary act in Scotland using the same model as the Human Rights Act. So there's already, again, there's a model of um, a legislative model there that could work and that would allow you to select uh, what, what it was you wished to uh, embed that would provide um, legal protection for those principles that are, you know, uh, in and of themselves, there's, there's not much common law behind them, at least certainly not in Britain and I, 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 in the UK, uh, except Scotland. I'm not familiar enough with Scottish law to be able to state what the common law position on dignity is. Questions are following on from, from your comments there. Um, it, it seems as if you would agree then that the uprating of benefits um, is absolutely essential to any commitment to, to, di to dignity and respect. I think it has to be a consideration. I definitely think it has to be a consideration because, um, I mean, benefit levels are set at a, at a floor, basic floor, and the floor itself has fallen. 
while living standards and living costs have increased, and so the differential between where the benefit levels are at and what it costs to live has increased. And there is clear evidence that people on benefits have not got access to dignity if that's all the income that they have to survive. So we've seen an increase in food banks, for example, and there's lots of research looking at the indignity of having to rely on food banks as an absolute measure of poverty. So um, again, it's a question for governments uh, in terms of resource priority, but if you're looking at it purely from a dignity perspective, then you'll want to start with what is defined as a minimum income necessary to uh, enjoy the rights of, of citizens uh, and of citizenship, to be able to feed your family without fear, to be able to meet your rent, to be able to take the kids to the cinema you know, once a month or to do something with them, to be able to enjoy life in the same way. Uh, and so I'd, you know, I'd, I'd look to those minimum income standards as a guide to what you might wish to set benefit levels at. Just one further, just one, one further question, if I may, Convener. Um, Northern Ireland seems to have a more extensive set of mitigations against welfare reform than Scotland, most notably around DLA <coughs> and PIP. And um, these are set in laws, entitlements, rather than being discretionary. And I'd just like you to give us some insight into whether you believe that is advantageous. OK, so this is part of the um, what was called the Fresh Start Agreement optimistically, um, which was the political agreement that allowed for the uh, legislative um, consent motion to pass the um, devolved powers back to Westminster at the same time as agreeing uh, an additional package to support mitigations in Northern Ireland. And the mitigations focus on, uh, the mitigations are a transitional time limited package. So the mitigations that you mentioned in relation to DLA uh, and PIP, there will be a transitional payment for somebody who uh, was on DLA and is transferred to PIP but is unsuccessfully transferred to PIP so it's not, not eligible for PIP but would have been eligible for DLA and there's a transitional payment there to enable them to adjust um, to the um, position that they're going to be in in a year's time. Um, as to whether that's been successful it's too soon I think to say but I, I think broadly we would we would see it as, as advantageous because it doesn't leave people on a cliff edge in quite the same way and will allow them to look into other possibilities rather than just coming off benefit and then having to figure it out. Um, so that those packages um, of, of mitigation payments were designed to deal with the impact of welfare reforms, such as the cliff edge whenever you come off DLA and don't get transferred to PIP. But they were um, agreed by government and they don't come within the benefit cap, so they are supplementary payments. They are additional to um, benefits that already get paid. Uh, and we don't know whether they will survive um, beyond the four-year period that they are currently scheduled to last. But there are some, you know, there are some interesting measures in there, and certainly they are worth looking at. Um, and there are things that haven't happened yet that I think will be interesting, such as a cost of working allowance, which will be to offset the um, universal credit uh, work alliance issues. So uh, we hope that they'll be successful. I haven't seen the implementation of them effectively to understand e exactly how they're working and I think that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adam Tomkins. Thank you, um, and thank you, Professor McKeever, for um, joining us this morning. I, I, can, I, can I just say before I ask my question that it, uh, I, was, I was a member of the Smith Commission. Uh, which designed the package of um, welfare devolution that is um, has now been legislated for in the Scotland Act 2016. And the Smith Commission um, looked at the experience of Northern Ireland and uh, didn't look at it for very long because we very quickly, and I think unanimously, realised that it wasn't what we wanted for Scotland at all. The whole point of welfare devolution in Scotland is, to allow, is, is precisely to enable the two governments to pursue different welfare policies, different social security policies, if that's what they... Uh, choose to do, which is the opposite of the um, of the of, of, of the constitutional position uh, in in Northern Ireland. So the package in Scotland is expressly designed, with it in mind, not to replicate really anything very much about the, the Northern Ireland um, experience. Um, w w with that in mind, however, I I, I am interested um, in um, uh, the extent to which the current constitutional settlement in uh, um, Northern Ireland enables uh, the Assembly government, when it exists, to pursue um, uh, different policies um, uh, from those which are preferred by the UK government. And, uh, and in particular, 
Um, so if you could just flesh that out a bit, that would, that would, be, that would be helpful. And in particular, wh whether there is any sort of equivalent in the Northern Ireland um, settlement of the no detriment principle in Scotland, um, which is, as I understand it, that you know, if the Scottish Government wishes to um, uh, uh, legislate for welfare benefits to be more generous than they are in the rest of the UK, then that money will have to be found from within the Scottish budget. And vice versa, if the Scottish Government decided to make um, uh, social security benefits less generous than they are in the rest of the UK, the Scottish budget would keep those um, savings and wouldn't hand them back to um, the, the Treasury. It sounded to me, I just wanted to make sure that I've got this right, that the opposite of, the opposite of that is the case in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, yes. Um, I'll go backwards on those questions. So the no detriment principle, we don't have an equivalent. Um, and that, uh, I, I guess it's probably a grand statement to say that there was a, a, a constitutional objective to devolutionary powers in Northern Ireland in 1920. I mean, it was a settlement following civil war. So I don't think the constitutional objection uh, or the constitutional focus was on Social Security at that time in 1920. There wasn't even a welfare state. So the, it's just how it's evolved. And um, the no detriment principle doesn't apply in Northern Ireland. We don't have it in our constitutional settlement. We don't have it in the 1998 um, Act uh, following from the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so if there was a more generous provision provided by the Northern Ireland Executive of Social Security benefits, that would have to be met by the Northern Ireland Executive. But we would also, if we provided a system that produced savings, those savings would, um, would in effect have to be handed back to the Treasury. Now, that's a complex pattern or, or pathway to get to that conclusion, but that's very much what the Treasury position is. And so if that was to be contested, it would it would undoubtedly, undoubtedly require some complex arguments on both sides, but I think that the overall conclusion is that that money would be handed back. It wouldn't be kept by Northern Ireland. In relation to um, how the constitutional settlement allows Northern Ireland to deviate, there isn't really any limit on what the Northern Ireland Parliament can do to deviate from um, Social Security uh, in Britain. The limit is around fiscal ability. Um, so the the Section 87 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 recognises the symmetry between the two systems and talks about the need to have agreement between um, the, DW, the uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions in the Northern Ireland uh, government to, um, to agree the extent to which deviations might happen, but there is no um, constitutional imperative uh, that that must maintain parity or there's no constitutional objection to parity being breached. It's simply around... Um, if Northern Ireland was to create a bespoke system, it would have to agree that it, it would finance the new IT, it would finance the new administration, it would finance the additional costs that might come from a benefit system, it would look to you know, all of the implementation issues itself. Um, I don't think that the UK government has any particular issue with Northern Ireland doing that. I've never seen that raised as a, as a concern by the UK government but we are bound by the <coughs> fact that we're already relying on subventions from the Treasury and so the the financial incentive to change is not there. So there's no equivalent in Northern Ireland of our fiscal framework. Um, in our fiscal framework, the UK and the Scottish governments <coughs> agreed to share the costs of um, the implementation costs of um, social security devolution. So there's a, a payment going from Treasury to Scottish government of 200 million pounds to help the Scottish government set up the infrastructure that it needs to develop. Um, uh, devolved social security regimes here in Scotland. There's no equivalent of that, of that, of that in Northern Ireland. To my knowledge, there is now. This is not my area of expertise, but the, um, the fis there is, of course, fiscal um, uh, um, agreements with Treasury on how the uh, subventions happen and on, on what basis they happen. Uh, and the um, agreements will be... Um, there are three in particular that I can't think of off the top of my head. Happy to give the committee more information um, at a later date if that's helpful. Um, but the reading of those provisions is not uh, that the devolutionary powers would be shared, the cost would be shared by the UK government. The position, as I understand it, is if Northern Ireland wishes to do it differently, it's free to do so, but it will have to do it off its own bat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ben McPherson, you want to come in? Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Good morning. I note in the journal uh, paper that you, you, you uh, provided us with before the, the, the committee that you uh, argue that the, the role of the Social Security Advisory Committee in providing independent advice to the Scottish and UK governments 
uh, to ensure coherence across related benefit systems would seem to be required. And, and in relation to that, uh, I've just got a, a few questions, if, if, if you don't mind. Do you think that a statutory body is, is necessary for an independent Scottish scrutiny body? Uh, what would be necessary for such a body to be effective? And uh, somewhat aside but related, do you think the Scottish Parliament should have a role in being a scrutiny body? For example, you know, what is the role of elected representatives in, in that scrutiny? Um, so, take your questions in order. The first is that um, you've asked whether a statutory body, uh, an independent body, would need to be statutory. Um, things are always better protected in statute than they are on the whim of a government. So my instinct would be to say yes, um, that, that it should be a statutory body, it would be an arm's length independent body, and its remit would be in some way similar to the Social Security Advisory Committee that would have a remit to review how Social Security works and to review draft legislation. Um, putting it in statute does protect it, does protect its independence as well, um, because it's, um, it's not subject to political women in the same way. Um, we've seen um, the bonfire of the Quangos a few years back when, under the coalition government and the idea that you can reduce the role of, of arm's length bodies for some very good reasons and others not so good. Um, being able to have a statutory remit for a body I think marks it out as a particular, having a particular function that has a particular value and of course it can be removed from legislation um, without uh, uh, with, with the consent of Parliament, with the consent of government, um, but I think that m putting it in legislation puts a very clear message that this is a necessary feature of scrutiny, that it has to be an independent body, that it is there for a particular purpose, and that it provides additional constitutional comfort to um, the Parliament to hold the executive to account. Um, it doesn't have to be in, in legislation, but I guess I had conceived it in that way because it mirrors the creation of the Social Security Advisory Committee. Um, in relation to your question on what's necessary for a body to be effective, I think that's a really good question. Um, the, um, what's and, I, and I draw on my own experience of the Social Security Advisory Committee, again, speaking as a member and not um, the voice of the committee. What I find to be very effective there is the range of expertise that's there. So you have very clear technical expertise from members like um, Judith Patterson from CPAG Scotland, for example, who has very clear detailed workings of the regulations, can drill down on the technical detail, can understand where this legislation doesn't fit with other pieces of legislation definitions. So the, the outworkings of how this will play um, very clearly identified and the problems avoided from the outset. But the range of expertise, I think, is absolutely critical. So. Um, there's a statutory position for the Northern Ireland member, which I hold, uh, and that provides some uh, oversight of, of where things are different um, in other areas um, and allows us to consider issues from different angles. There's uh, positions for people with experience of disability, people uh, with experience of um, employers and employment. Um, so TUC representatives, for example, have been on the committee uh, in the past. Um, and bringing a range of expertise around Committees can be very effective. Sometimes committees can be ineffective because it's just a whole cacophony of voices. But, um, but the effectiveness is about having different input into seeing how this legislation fits with other legislative measures, seeing what the output will be like, seeing how, um, how the, the legislation might be changed in order to avoid unintended consequences to soften the edges. It's absolutely not to have um, a role in demanding policy change. That's not the business of an independent arm's length body, which I guess takes me to the, your third point on whether there should be um, a role for the Scottish Parliament. I take it you mean within that committee rather than generally or perhaps both? Uh, I'd be interested in your opinions on both. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the value for the Social Security Advisory Committee is that it doesn't have parliamentary um, members involved in the committee and so there is no ideological objective that dominates or that has an influence and so that would be my um, personal view on on whether there should be parliamentary representation on a, an, an independent advisory committee. I think the point of independence is that it is independent from government influence and it is able to make recommendations on the face of the legislation rather than on what policy intent might be preferred. Um, in relation to scrutiny of, of legislation by the Scottish Parliament, I think that has to happen. You have to be able to hold the executive to account, whichever executive exists, it has to happen. The difficulty with 
the scrutiny of secondary legislation is that you can't do anything about it once the once the bill or once the the draft regulations are laid you can either accept them or reject them but you can't change them and so the difficulty becomes if you like most of what's happening but not all of it you've got a choice to make on whether you reject it uh, you know through the baby out with the bathwater effectively so making a, an independent committee giving them the power to scrutinise and change the face of the legislation before it's laid, I think is probably one of the most valuable things and one of the most effective things that the Social Security Advisory Committee does. Um, but it can change around the edges some of the issues that will affect the implementation. So again, it's looking at the outcome rather than you know, aiming to change the policy process or aiming to change the policy objectives. Uh, and that then means that the legislation that goes before um, Parliament is more robust, it doesn't have, um, it, it has a better chance of avoiding unintended consequences. The ability of Parliament to scrutinise, I think, will be fairly limited because there will be, on, I, I imagine, a, quite a volume of legislation that will flow from um, devolved powers. Um, in, uh, in the last parliamentary year, the Social Security Advisory Committee scrutinised 44 pieces of legislation. That's at a time when there wasn't major welfare reform. Most of those were taken through without any major incidents. Some of them were very technical. Some were quite controversial, and some we did go out to consultation on. But the ability of, of a Westminster Parliament to scrutinise 44 sets of regulations was limited, and it has a second chamber. The Scottish Parliament only has one chamber, and so there's a huge burden there on parliamentarians who will not necessarily have the time or the expertise to be able to provide that scrutiny. So I think it provides some constitutional comfort um, to be able to have an independent body that is independent of Parliament, that will advise Parliament, and Parliament can choose to take the advice or not take the advice, that's, that's another matter. Um, and that will give um, a chance for the legislation to be to be able to deliver the policy intent. So, I mean, that's a trick with legislation. You might, you know, the, the policy intent might be quite simple. And I think of universal credit in particular, it's, it's a very simple idea. Let's simplify the benefit system so that you just claim one benefit. But when you go to deliver that, it turns out not to be so simple. So being able to see what the legislation looks like and being able to scrutinise it effectively is the way that the social security system will develop in Scotland. And you want to get that right because it's, you, know, you don't want to have to keep going back and changing the regulations because that takes more parliamentary time, more scrutiny and so on. Um, the absence of a second chamber you know, it's, I think it's a consideration. It's not that the um, House of Lords will always throw back a piece of legislation to the Commons and refuse to, to implement it, but uh, I think it's still an important um, check, on the, check and balance on the executive. So you want to, to be able to have that system in place um, so, that, so that the system is protected rather than just it being a case of, well, these are the welfare forms we're looking at now. The Scottish Government is pleased that we're going to look at principles of dignity and respect, and so we can trust the executive. That may well be the case, but this is going to be a system that you want to endure. So you want to put the position in place now that this is going to last, that's going to have scrutiny that continues, that allows the executive to be held to account and to deliver the policy intent in the way that it intends to deliver it, rather than in an unintended, um, adverse way. For that detail. An insightful analysis. Thank you, <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you again for all the information you've shared so far with us. I wonder if I could just get some of your advice in regard to um, residential issues and entitlement to then benefit. If we end up in Scotland where we could end up with differential payments um, north and south of the border, I, I mean that's Scotland, England, not to with an island context. Um, how would you see that working? So, for example, if I was to be successful in getting PIP in Aberdeen, but then due to work, move to Plymouth, how would that work if I'm on a higher award? Would you see some kind of intergovernment agreement that that would last for a, a certain period of time? Would I have to reapply for PIP? south of the border, if I was north of the border. And the other thing might work, there may be an older person who's on attendance allowance in Birmingham, but because of family reasons, moves to uh, north of the border. And again, the, the, the amount of money, the entitlement might be slightly different on rules and regulations. Have you had any experience of how would that work? And is there, in your view, a minimum period of time someone has to have been resident within a country before we can claim an award, because I think at the moment, as the legislation stands, I could live anywhere in the UK and claim the new awards that come out of the Social Security Bill in Scotland. Yeah. Um, 
I think that's a really tough question. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to answer it to complete satisfaction. In terms of, um, there is some experience in Northern Ireland with moving geographically. So lots of um, regulations um, that we scrutinise in, in the Social Security Advisory Committee will relate to the geography of the GB um, jurisdiction. And then we'll have to have mirror image regulations for Northern Ireland. And that means that there can be a shortfall between moving from Northern Ireland to uh, GB. Uh, and the way that that has been managed more often than not is through an agreement, an interdepartmental agreement, that if somebody has claimed a benefit in GB and they transfer to Northern Ireland, they move to Northern Ireland, that that entitlement can maintain. But it does sometimes take the issue to be raised and for action to be threatened, perhaps. Um, legal action, a pre-action protocol letter, for example, might have to be taken to ensure that that position is, is uh, addressed and identified. Um, because it's not always obvious um, that that's people will want to move to Northern Ireland or out of Northern Ireland. But in relation to um, finding ways to do it, there are inter uh, interdepartmental ways that can be done. And they can be very straightforward, but the straightforward element of that is that the benefit entitlement will be the same in both jurisdictions, um, both in terms of the, the um, provision that's been made and the conditions, the criteria for the benefits. So it becomes a little bit more complicated, and that's why I'm not sure that I know what the answer to your question is in relation to moving from Aberdeen to Southampton um, on how that interaction might work. Uh, if the benefits, if they are the same benefits, then it's fine. But if it's two different sets of benefits, then there's going to have to be some protocol arranged that will allow for some certainty for claimants to understand that if they move, there will be some protection, time limited perhaps, and probably advisably, um, that would allow them to move for shorter periods of time and then to return, um, or to move for a short period of time, decide to stay, but have that, that time to make a new application if that's required, if it's a different um, benefit, a different entitlement criteria and a different payment. Um, there are minimum periods of time that relate to um, geography, that relate to people moving out of um, GB, moving out of Northern Ireland. Particularly, we have this in relation to our north-south border. So people who move to a different jurisdiction entirely, a different country, um, a different um, legal system, different benefit, a benefit system. And we have to have some provision for that because there's a lot of cross-border movement. And so that tends to be on a time-limited basis. So if you are out of the country, um, for a certain period of time. It might be, depending on what it is, depending on what the benefit is, it might be for four weeks, it might be for housing benefit, it might be for four weeks, but there might be exceptions built in for victims of domestic violence, for example, that might extend to 12 weeks, or it might extend for um, individuals who work overseas. So um, members of uh, security forces, for example, will have some, there'll be some guidance there on how to model that. But as I say, the difficulty will be that these are two different types of benefits. So you could have a time-limited period that would allow you to carry your Scottish devolved benefit to Southampton. You could maintain that for four weeks or for longer if you were moving for domestic violence purposes, for example. Um, sorry, because you were a victim of domestic violence, not for domestic violence purposes. But... Okay, briefly, would you see that being a regulation or would you see some kind of definition of the principle of this within the, the heart of the bill? Uh, ideally, you'd want to see it in the in the heart of the bill because the bill will provide the legal certainty that you will look for in terms of dignity, and, and dignity will involve people knowing what their circumstances, um, what what they will be entitled to in the face of changing circumstances. So they'll want some some degree of legal certainty, and some element of the rule of law will apply to that. The difficulty might be that you might put a principle into a piece of legislation that you can't deliver. So there would need to be an understanding that that was something that could be delivered by the Scottish Government, that there would be agreement with um, sister uh, departments in Northern Ireland or in uh, the rest of the UK, that there could be an arrangement to be reached. The way that um, time-limited periods and periods for um, receiving, continuing to receive benefits while out of the country works um, for Northern Ireland and um, for housing benefit purposes, for example, is through regulations. So that would be a way to um, respond to changing circumstances that you can see that are arising uh, and might be another way to negotiate the, the differences as they become apparent when the Scottish system develops. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have a yeah. uh, Thank you very much. Um, I think what you said earlier to members of the committee about the importance of the Social Security Advisory Body is really helpful. Um, you said some other things about scrutiny and 
I just want to, because this year I think is so important, I just wanted to go over this and just make sure I understood um, what you said. So I'm clear about the importance of the Social Security Advisory Body and what it could do. Um, but you also went on to say that um, a memorandum of understanding with the DWP um, to let the UK Social Security have some scrutiny on Scotland's legislation. And you also talked about cross-membership through an intergovernmental agreement. Um, I just wanted to, to understand how they might fit together. And obviously, I suppose the final element to that is the Scottish Parliament uh, committee system itself having a role in scrutiny and recommendation and policy. Um, so anything you could add to just um, explain to the committee how you think it all might fit together would be helpful. Um, the memorandum of understanding idea comes from what already exists in relation to the relationship between HMRC and the Social Security Advisory Committee. So when the Social Security Advisory Committee was set up, it scrutinised Social Security benefits, which were contained within one department. And then tax credits came along and HMRC had responsibility for that, but that became something that was important um, in Social Security terms to be within um, a scrutiny provision. And so the arrangement was reached that there would be a memorandum of understanding with HMRC that the Social Security Advisory Committee could review the regulations. It has no power to take them, it has no power to take them on formal reference. And so it's only um, advisory insofar as the, um, the committee's role is advisory, but the memorandum of understanding means that we don't have a statutory power to take the, the HMRC regulations on formal consultation. So if we saw something coming through that we felt was insufficiently supported by evidence, for example, as we have in the past. Our options are fairly limited. Um, we, we don't have the power to say, you should change these regulations. We can talk to officials, and that's a very um, valuable process of working behind the scenes with officials to say, can we look at this again? Can you go back and see if this amendment could be made or this adjustment could be made? Um, so it's a possibility to, to encourage cooperation. It doesn't always work but it's a way to engage two departments that otherwise have very different ambitions. So the Department for Work and Pensions ambitions on benefits, I think it's fair to say, is very different from HMRC's ambitions on, on Social Security benefits. So that's a model that could work <coughs> to get the two committees together, to, if, if we assume that there would be a, a Scottish version of the Social Security Advisory Committee, to allow some um, discussion between the two, some scrutiny role, some interaction, um, and to begin to see where the overlaps lie so that one committee could adjust its advice to the UK government and the other could adjust its advice to the Scottish government, depending on how those overlaps played out. But of course that will require intergovernmental agreement, so I'm not going to assume that that would happen. I'm not going to assume that either government would be content for that to happen. Um, Cross-membership would be that you would have um, a position on each committee for a member from the other committee and that um, position would be uh, presumably a reserved position. Um, the Northern Ireland position, for example, is a statutory position to give insight into what happens in Northern Ireland. Now, it's not an ideal position. I don't, I mean, if I don't speak for the Social Security Advisory Committee, I sure as heck don't speak for Northern Ireland. So the idea that I can, you know, present some difficulty. So, so the idea of a, a committee behind that Scottish voice or the committee behind that UK voice, I think is more helpful. Um, that would allow for um, the chair of a Scottish committee, for example, to have a position on the UK Social Security Advisory Committee. Again, there may be some issues around that. The appointments on the UK Social Security Advisory Committee are made by the minister, um, the UK minister uh, for work and pensions. So my position is run past the Northern Ireland ministers, but it will ultimately be the decision of the UK minister. Uh, and that might not be something that the Scottish Government would wish to entertain, or it might think it's a, you know, it's a quid pro quo, but the quid pro quo would be that on the Scottish Committee, that position, the reserve position for the UK member, would effectively be someone appointed by the UK Government, um, by the UK Minister. So again, that's where the political difficulty might lie. I don't think it's insurmountable, but I wouldn't wish to assume again that that agreement would be there. Uh, and so the third option was just to kind of have two parallel committees that would have some more informal um, arrangement between them to, um, to keep in touch with each other and to coordinate and cooperate on a more informal basis. I think that could be accommodated within the work that the Social Security Advisory Committee currently does. So, for example, 
at our last meeting, we had um, a presentation from the Northern Ireland Department uh, on issues affecting Northern Ireland, and that's a standard. And we, you know, we do stakeholder visits. We did a stakeholder visit to Scotland. We're due to do, go to Wales this year. Been to Northern Ireland before that. So I think there is form there for the Social Security Advisory Committee to take account of what's happening in Scotland and to adjust its recommendations on that basis. We have a customary position at the at the moment. Um, so it's by custom and practice that we have a Scottish member. In fact, we have two Scottish members. Dr. Jim McCormick is, is the other member um, from Scotland, uh, along with Judith Patterson. And so that is helpful. We have a, a position as well for Wales. But again, it's just being able to see that, that those members from the other devolved uh, areas can bring that expertise to it. And it's much easier to bring it from a, a committee uh, that's looking at this in Scotland than it would be just for an individual to have, a, have, have their own insight into what's happening. Is that helpful? Yes, so, so the, the cross-membership would be, so rel relates to the Social Security Advisory Body. In other words, it would be someone from each parliament on the corresponding committee to give some... Each committee. So the committee would be an arm's length body. That It wouldn't be yeah. the, the committee, the parliamentary committee. So which reminds me, you did ask about the role of the parliamentary committees on that. Um, they would be arm's length bodies, so they wouldn't be the parliamentary committee. So I'm not proposing that um, a member of the yeah. Social Security Committee would go and sit in the Work and Pensions Committee. I mean, that's a whole different ballgame. I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> but I think there is a role for this for this committee to scrutinise legislation, and certainly this committee and its predecessor has very good form on, you know, investigating the impact of welfare reform. There's some really valuable work that's been done there. But I worry about your capacity to do it because there are going to be so many issues with welfare reform. There are going to be so many issues with the devolved benefits that I think your, your plate's going to be pretty full. And the ability to provide detailed technical scrutiny of the draft regulations might have to be considered. Um, certainly, the recommendation that we made in the um, report for the Equality and Human Rights Commission was that that should be kept under, under close uh, scrutiny itself, because it may well be that, that the committee becomes overwhelmed and therefore isn't able to discharge that duty. Having said that, I think there is a very clear role for the um, Scottish committee to be able to understand what is developing. And so you could take evidence from a Social Security Advisory Committee from, from the UK, as well as the Scottish Social Security Committee, to, to be informed on that. The other aspect of the Social Security Advisory Committee is that it has a remit to do independent research. So that's its other statutory function. And if that was a similar statutory function in a Scottish body, then that might work very well with your remit so that you would identify issues that would be of value to this committee for that advisory committee to look at. Um, we work with, um, we, you know, we, we speak to officials and to lots of stakeholders and to government ministers to identify what we think would be useful to look at in our independent work programme. And so there might be additional complementarity there between the parliamentary committee and the independent committee that would scrutinise regulations. And that research and information that can be shared with the parliamentary committee. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, before I bring Mark Griffiths in, you were talking about, obviously, committees. Uh, we have had meetings with the Scottish Affairs Committee. We have been here, we've been down at Westminster. It's the intention of this committee and theirs to meet again. Would you say that would be a good way to air the issues in regards to what is obviously devolved to Scotland and reserved to the Westminster, uh, that could iron out, hopefully anyway, uh, some obstacles. Would you say that was still a good way to go ahead? I would say so. I, I mean, I, I don't know much about politics. I'm an academic, so uh, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my game. But it always seems to me that talking behind the scenes seems to achieve quite a lot. And certainly that's been the experience in the Social Security Advisory Committee, that the kind of head to head of the, of the ministers, you know, is where they bold statements happen, but actually the hard work gets done behind the scenes where you can agree with individuals on the extent to which changes can be made and the extent to which agreement might be reached. So I think that political process would be very helpful in being able to understand what the issues are and how the resolutions might be agreed uh, and to come to compromises where that's possible um, on that issue of, of scrutiny over the border and, and how that would work. Yep, thanks, Kavina. On the, um, the mitigation package that was agreed, can I just ask, my understanding is that the Northern Ireland Executive came to a policy decision and then it was passed to the DWP to implement that operationally. Is that correct? No. Um, in terms of the supplementary payments mitigations that, that Northern Ireland had, the policy agreement um, was reached with 
the political agreement was reached with the UK government that there would be a mitigations package that was then um, handed to a working group uh, chaired by Professor Eileen Evison, who, uh, working with um, other members, identified a set of package, a set of mitigation measures that she thought would be effective <coughs> in mitigating the impact of welfare reform. Those recommendations were put to the um, executive. The executive agreed them, and the implementation now falls to Northern Ireland. So, um, for the most part, uh, sorry, I'll correct myself. The implementation. Um, the legislation to implement the mitigations package for the most part falls to DWP because of the legislative consent motion. Um, but there are some of the mitigations that will not be possible for DWP to implement, so we're still awaiting some mitigations in relation to universal credit, for example. The mitigations relation to, relating to the legacy payments have been implemented by DWP. Others will have to have uh, the Assembly approval. So we're in a bit of a tight spot because we don't have an assembly, um, but those powers will pass back to the assembly if and when the assembly is restored, so that it will be up to Northern Ireland to implement those measures if they're still outstanding. And then the delivery is through the Department for Communities, so that the, the Department for Communities will be the body that will be implementing the supplementary payment system and uh, advising on how the claimants can, can access those payments and the implications of that access. Okay. So you think that that is the right way to go for the Scottish Government as well, say, for example, the powers over top-up or the power to create a new benefit, that it, it would be as advisable for the Scottish Government to pursue those as administratively on their own as well, rather than, say, contract or tender to DWP to, to implement those? I mean, my instinct is to say yes, because um, part of what we, we identified in the uh, report on dignity and social security was that it's, as, it's not just about what you put in the face of a piece of legislation, it's about cultural changes and cultural shifts in attitudes. And the work that has been done by my colleague, Dr. Mark Simpson, looks at the kind of cultural differences between um, different areas of social security administration and the um, ability in Northern Ireland to sanction less, for example, seems to be partly around a culture which is quite Northern Ireland specific, um, about not wishing to rock the boat um, and so not, not necessarily sanctioning because there may be other um, ramifications which hopefully won't apply in Scotland, but, um, but also being able to communicate more readily and effectively with claimants so that you can understand what their behaviour is to help them avoid sanctional sanctions or, or, or breaching other conditions or falling foul of application processes. So I think if you're going to devolve the, um, the legislation, it would make sense to keep the devolved administration involved in that process. Um, it has been, I think, more effective in Northern Ireland than handing that administration back to DWP. But that's a, that's a view that um, is informed by attitudes rather than, than a, a constitutional position on who should administer the benefits. OK, and on the... The flexibilities around universal credit. Um, how simple is that process going? Gone between um, governments of agreeing those flexibilities and, and administering them, and administrating them. Because um, here we've had some um, legislation around the uh, payments directly to landlord, but there seems to be. Um, but a bit more difficulty around technicalities around spot payments, which is something I think the government and parliament would be minded to go ahead with, but there seems to be some debate about um, technicalities around being able to implement that or not. What has the situation been in Northern Ireland? The situation in Northern Ireland is that we haven't yet introduced universal credit. You've got me a week too soon. We introduced it on the 27th of September. So we haven't seen how those technical details will play out, but Social Security is just bedeviled by technical difficulties. Um, and I think if you were to be concerned about technical difficulties in Social Security, you wouldn't do anything. So I don't mean to make light of the situation. I think you're right that there are lots of difficulties. I know that the Work and Pensions Committee was taking evidence yesterday on universal credit and difficulties for um, payments reaching landlords. So I think that there are difficulties, and I don't underestimate um, how, how much work will be involved to overcome those difficulties. But I think that... Um, I think it's a worthwhile endeavour to do it because I think that that will make a difference to um, the experience of universal credit for many claimants and so there has to be something that should be done. We don't yet have the experience in Northern Ireland of how it's going to work out. We're already having some difficulties in terms of um, 
recognising identity uh, certificates. So for Northern Ireland citizens under the Northern Ireland Act, you can have an Irish passport or a British passport or both. But DWP, if you put in an Irish passport, it doesn't work so well because um, we don't, you know, DWP doesn't pay benefits to Irish citizens, except that it does in Northern Ireland. So we're already seeing some of the glitches that are happening and they just have to be worked through. Um, I don't know what the solutions to those more difficult questions about split payments and so on will be. Um, the legislation is there, we haven't tested it. So perhaps in a year's time I'll come back with some solutions, but I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor McKeever. I was going to ask about the advisory committee, but I think you've given a very full explanation uh, of your involvement uh, to other questions. So once again, thank you very much for taking the time and the evidence has been excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is agenda item four, and it's a report back from Ben McPherson on MECOP uh, workshop. Ben, do you want to start? Th thank you, convener. On the 29th of August, I attended a workshop along with uh, users of uh, MECOP, which stands for a Minority Ethnic Carers of Older People project, which is based in my constituency with the, the ethos of working in partnership with carers, the voluntary and statutory sectors. MECOP actively seeks to challenge and dismantle barriers that deny black and minority ethnic carers access to health, social work and other social care services in Edinburgh, the Lothians and further afield. We discussed, uh, as is detailed in the committee papers, a number of aspects of the Social Security Bill. First of all, uh, the concept of the principles was discussed, and I should note that all discussions took place in Cantonese and were translated. So uh, from the attendees, there was general support uh, for the principles. Uh, however, it was agreed that in the current system, it can be extremely difficult for those who don't speak English to access information on benefits or speak to officials over the phone. And uh, also challenges around making use of uh, IT facilities um, and are often reliant on support workers to help them because of language barriers. Uh, and uh, therefore, an additional principle regarding equity of access was suggested, i.e. equal access to information advice and to be able to apply for benefits. It was also suggested that there should be specific help and support made available for non-English speaking communities, so essentially equal access to information concerning uh, sections 1E one, one e and uh, F, for example, of the bill. We then went uh, on to discuss the Charter and there was a general agreement, a strong agreement, I would say, that the Charter is a good idea. There was support for the reports that are detailed in the Charter, uh, so an agreement that the annual report should be honest, sufficiently detailed and publicly available. It was suggested that as principles can be difficult to pin down, it would be helpful to have a, a concrete set of standards underpinning each, each one. There was also discussion about the fact that uh, engagement in the Charter, both in its creation and its uh, ongoing uh, scrutiny, was important. So there should be, uh, there was a suggestion made that an expert panel, perhaps like the Scottish Government's experience panels, could be set up to assess whether the principles in Charter are working in practice, and panels could be set up for different communities. Uh, otherwise, it could be difficult for people to access if English was not their first language. The next item of discussion was the rules. Again, there was general support for the rules, but the point was raised again that effort will need to be made to make sure those in non-English speaking communities are aware of them. And attendees suggested that support organisations such as MECOP could play a role in helping to support this. Uh, a discussion then took place on the certain benefits uh, which are being, being devolved and, and included in the bill. Uh, particular discussion on funeral payments and it was suggested that a quicker and more efficient system and decision making process is needed to make things easier for people during uh, such a difficult time. And on cold weather payments there was a suggestion that the temperature at which the cold payment is triggered could, could be looked at as elderly people are more susceptible to the cold and therefore have higher heating costs. Um, and it was also suggested again that it could be offered to those with uh, chronic, sorry, not again, chronic illnesses and, and, and mobility issues. In terms of uh, short-term assistance, most attendees agreed that short-term assistance is a good idea 
and that should not have to be paid back once a decision regarding a claimant's benefits has been made. So uh, no repayment, uh, for example. And uh, in general, that, that it should be a quick, efficient, accurate decision-making process in, in, in across uh, the, 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 the different aspects uh, so that there is less need for this kind of assistance to be supplied. And lastly, given that the, the, the participants were carers, there was very strong support and agreement amongst the attendees about the proposed increase in the carers' allowance. Uh, a suggestion was made that financial help should be available for the period immediately after someone's caring responsibility ends uh, as, in order to provide a, a cushion thereafter. And lastly, uh, not necessarily related to the bill, but in order to make an accurate uh, summary of the discussion, issues were also raised about uh, carers' allowance and the state pension, which is, of course, a reserved matter that uh, uh, differences around how uh, carers' allowance and the state pension, uh, the relationship between them once the claimant reaches state pension age, which I think is an idea that's not been raised elsewhere. So I hope that provides... Uh, uh, insight into the important and interesting discussion that took place. Thank, thank you very much, Ben. It's an excellent uh, piece of, of work that's been done there, uh, particularly in the instances of, obviously, one benefit impinging on another, such as pensions. It's something that yeah, certainly is raising various uh, older people's groups as well. Anyone want to ask Ben any further questions in regards to the work that was carried out? Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, Ben. Thank you. Um, Alison, uh, agenda item uh, five is Alison. You want to report back from your workshop? Yeah, I'm um, certainly. I attended a Coalition of Carers event on the 30th of August as rapporteur for the committee, and um, I'm just going to report back on some of the issues that were raised on that day. Chris Boyland, who is the government lead official on the bill, um, presented uh, an overview of, of the bill and um, the many attendees raised various issues, and I'm just going to quickly update you on what they were. Um, there was discussion on the balance between primary and secondary legislation. I fear that regressive changes could be made too easily, as in current UK legislation. Um, there was a recognition that we needed to have a robust scrutiny procedure, including a Scottish version, perhaps, of the, Scottish, of the Social Security Advisory Committee. Um, there was a concern about principle seven, the principle that the system should be value for money. Um, they were concerned about you know, how you define that value for money could perhaps open the door to, to cuts and prioritisation of efficiency over rights. They felt that anti-poverty is a principle, um, that the social security system should actively work to reduce poverty, and that should be a key factor in any system, that there was a lack of clarity on rights in charter and that the section on charter doesn't clearly explain what people can expect and their ability to seek redress if their rights aren't respected. They would like to see an explicit commitment on the face of the bill that the private sector shouldn't have a role in the system. There were concerns raised about mandatory reconsideration too, worries that this could discourage appeals to tribunal um, as is the case with the UK procedure. And um, they also asked that, that people shouldn't have to repay overpaid benefits and, and for some clarity around that. On the issue of the carers allowance increase, as Ben McPherson pointed out, they were indeed pleased that there was to be an increase, but there was a view that the increase to JSA level doesn't reflect the value of the care they provide because it works out, it effectively provides £2 an hour for a 35-hour week um, and also raised the issue that Cares Allowance doesn't currently, currently allow people to claim more support if they care for more than one person. Um, and the 35-hour care rule means also that many carers can't get the benefits. You know, they could be caring for 34 hours. And, you know, so there was discussion around whether you, you know, different amounts should be looked at for different caring um, responsibilities. And they wanted Carers Allowance schedules to, to address those issues. Um, but it was a very interesting day and was pleased to attend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Alison, and for the excellent report back as well. Certainly in uh, some of the round table discussions, the carers allowance about the working limit and also when they get to a certain age, 
certainly was raised in some of the round tables I was at, so I think it's something the committee will, will, will have to look at as well. Any questions for Alison on the report back? No? OK, thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thank you very, very much. Um, our next item on the agenda is agenda item five. Um, and that's uh, looking at the social security... Oh. I'm sorry, I've missed the top part. I'm, look, I'm looking just now at the Auditor General. We spend, suspend the meeting for a couple of minutes until the Auditor General takes a seat. <laughs> Thank you.
We now re re reconvene the meeting, agenda item five, Social Security Bill, and we'll hear from the Auditor General. Uh, I just want to thank you very much, and I know you've been very busy today uh, with uh, another committee come straight from that, and uh, you want to make some opening remarks, Auditor General. Thank you. Convener, um, first of all, thanks for inviting us. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, um, and I'll make sure my opening remarks are very brief. I know your time is short. Um, We've published a briefing paper in May that pulls together the lessons learned from a range of work that we've done on previous IT projects and lessons from elsewhere around the world, which we hope will be useful for you in your consideration of this issue. Um, in that paper, we identified a number of common themes that have experienced um, difficulties in digital programs, which we've grouped in a set of five principles. They cover planning, governance, users, leadership and strategic oversight and assurance. Um, I think it's important for us to be clear that those principles can't be considered in isolation. They do interact with each other. And alongside them, we've pulled out throughout the briefing the importance of skills and experience as a cross-cutting theme that is critical to success. It's worth noting that alongside that briefing paper, we also published in March this year the latest in our series of audits on the way the government's implementing its new financial powers, of which Social Security is obviously a very important element. Um, and one of the key messages in that report was that, um, in many ways, moving into the Social Security powers is a step up in terms of complexity and scale of what they're trying to do, and that there are some real challenges still to be tackled. Um, things have moved on since we published that report in March um, and we'll be publishing a, a second report, a, a further report in spring 2018, which will look at progress since our report this year um, in the way it's planning and organising to deliver the social security uh, responsibilities, in particular the governance and leadership arrangements and the plans for developing the IT systems. And we'll, we'll also be looking at the costs and the progress achieved to date. Mark Taylor and Maura Campsey, who are with me here today, have been heavily involved in both those pieces of work, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Uh, and I know the excellent reports that you have produced, and the committee have them here. And look forward to the further report, uh, as you say, how we, how we go forward. Uh, my opening question would uh, basically be that what are the lessons that uh, you think should be taken into account uh, when we're designing the social security IT system? I think in broad terms, one of the important things that we pull out in our digital briefing is the importance of um, getting some of the planning in very early, um, whether that's planning for the scale of what the uh, system needs to do, planning to have the right skills and experience in place, or planning for the right governance arrangements. Very often when we look at um, a system that hasn't gone as planned, it's, it's right at the early stages that we see the roots of the problems, whether we're talking about the uh, Police I-6 uh, system, the NHS 24 system. Uh, so I think starting early is the key thing that we would be um, keen to, to see in place. Morag might want to add to that as a person who um, led on the digital briefing work for us. Yeah, I think, um, as the Auditor General says, the, the planning is um, key and in getting the right people involved from the start. I think um, having integrated uh, teams right at the start um, involving policy, serv service design and um, digital experts as well is also um, important. I think we've seen in the past that, especially when there's been um, complex um, policy areas um, involving an IT problem that sometimes um, the policy can be designed and, and then we find that the, it's maybe not quite, um, it's not very easy, shall we say, to then design a system to then to meet, to, to meet those outcomes. So that's something that's, that's, that's very important. I think as well, which will be key, is um, taking into consideration that there's, a, there's many benefits to come online and there may be others in the future. So developing a system that is future-proofed, if you like, that's easy to be um, changed as you go along is also, is also key. And I think um, governance arrangements are always critical and making sure you've got the right level of skills and understanding at all levels of governance is also, is, is also critical. Thank you very much for that. Certainly the committee has met with uh, you know, both sides together, uh, you know, from the Westminster and obviously from the Scottish Parliament. And they seem to be getting along very well uh, and doing quite a good job. But I've got other members that want to ask questions. And ben McPherson, you wanted to come in. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Auditor General. Good morning, all. The, uh, I think what's interesting about the paper is it, it starts off with the, the planning 
clarity around the, the need for thorough and effective planning, and that's also been raised today, uh, raised today uh, along with the concept of design. In one of my other responsibilities as a member of the subcommittee on policing, we looked at the uh, March 2017 paper that you uh, produced on I6, and I think one of the, the important lessons that came from that was at, at paragraph 15 around the difference between the waterfall method and the agile method of, of, of IT systems in terms of uh, developing distinct phases um, and making sh uh, so the, the for clarity for the rest of the committee, the waterfall <laughs> method is where software is developed in distinct phases, each leading to the next phase in a sequence resembling a waterfall. Uh, and that creates potential for uh, if one phase isn't delivered, then the next phase is, is stalled. Whereas the uh, agile uh, development system is a more flexible incremental approach where the teamwork uh, is on a small scale uh, launches of a function product uh, is the wording in, in your report. I guess I know this is quite technical, but I just wanted to raise it as an issue because to me it was the standout point in this I6 review and I think for the benefit of getting this right for social security, it's, 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 it, it's one that's worth raising. I just wondered if you agreed and, and what your thoughts were on that. Yes, absolutely, Mr. McPherson. I think um, I hope one of the themes that comes through in the digital briefing is that sense that um, although it can be tempting to think about a big bang approach that, t that aims to tackle the whole of a big problem all at once, um, our experience and experience from other projects elsewhere suggests that increasingly it's much more important to break it down into manageable chunks and to be thinking about how you can build from a, a, a good start um, onto uh, the things that matter in future particularly in this case, as Morag has said, um, as we know, the existing benefits that are within scope will come on over time, and there's always the possibility of further um, changes to the devolution settlement in, in the context that we're all working in. Um, I think that's increasingly possible with project management approaches like Agile and the way that technology is changing um, with much more development being done through um, rapid prototyping and the development of apps that do particular things but that interact with each other. Um, but I think it's also important to be clear that if that's the approach you're taking, you need to be building that in at the beginning in terms of your options appraisal, the procurement options that you consider, and again, the skills and experience that you have. Um, Morag will want to expand, but we have seen examples of people starting to use Agile without fully understanding what the implications of that are um, and again having to sort of back up and start again. Morag. Yeah, I think um, you're right. Agile is being used quite a lot more in the, the public sector. We're seeing that happen um, and it, it is um, likely that, that, that Agile will be used and it, there may be parts of um, the programme that, that will use more traditional methods because that's, um, you know, it, you can kind of tweak things and see which is best the best fit for what you're trying to deliver. I think what will be key is um, setting up the, at the procurement stage, making sure that the, everything's in place to um, align to whatever methodology is being used. And again, I come back to, to the governance arrangements quite often. We've, we've seen in the past when Agile has been used, um, the, the, the governance boards maybe haven't fully understood the, the Agile methodology. And I think what will be key is um, setting out clearly where um, decisions are going to be made and, and, and what speed decisions need to be made at, because that's always a critical feature of Agile as well. So I think being being clear about um, where decisions will be made and who's making those decisions, who's responsible for that, will be a, a, a factor as well. Thank you. And I, I guess, like I6, uh, in fact, to an even greater extent in terms of complexity, in terms of using w, uh, DWP data and uh, existing systems, is an agile approach almost essential in your view because of the need to be agile, excuse the pun, uh, to the, the, the sheer complexity and differentiation in the data and systems that are going to be inherited or uh, built upon in terms of delivering uh, the new, uh, new, new benefits within a new IT structure? I think um, the Scottish Government itself is probably still thinking through um, in terms of, of of what, what method to use um, for what piece of the, the programme, if, if you like. Um, so I wouldn't say like that one would be better than the other. Um, it's just what's, what's key that that's all thought through and planned and the right processes and, and arrangements are put in place to, to manage that and, and, and scrutinise the activity as well to make sure everything's being delivered. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, 
Adam Tonkins. Mexico. Yeah, good morning. Um, uh, you, you may know that yesterday the Finance Committee on which I sit um, took evidence from uh, the Bill team and from other officials from the Scottish Government about the financial memorandum uh, associated with this bill. Um, and the Finance Committee will report to this committee in, in, in due course. But I think it's fair to say that there were a number of concerns, not all of which were resolved yesterday, um, ab about some of the numbers used in the financial memorandum, and in particular, and relevantly to today's proceedings, um, concerns about the figure of £190 million pounds that's used in the financial memorandum um, uh, in, in, in connection with the IT costs. Um, how do you think we should treat that figure? Um, I think there are two things to say, and I will ask Mark to come in shortly. Um, the first is I know one of the areas for discussion yesterday was the relationship between the figures in the fiscal framework agreement for funding new devolved powers, including Social Security, and the thing, figure in the financial memorandum. Um, and uh, we reported in our March 2017 update on new financial powers about the way in which the figures in the fiscal framework had been reached. Um, it's clear from the doc documentation that's available that they were not intended as an estimate of the costs. They were a contribution that the UK government is making to the Scottish government's costs. So it's, I think it's important to get that on the record, first of all. The second um, is the quality of the estimate which is in the financial memorandum. Um, and I think it's entirely appropriate that the committees of the Parliament subject those to uh, proper scrutiny. We have seen examples in the past where those figures haven't um, stood the test of time as a policy has developed um, and the uh, new services, new um, agencies have been put in place. Um, what we will be auditing as part of our continuing work is the basis on which those estimates have been developed and then and how they are standing up against experience as the work rolls out. Um, and I'll ask Mark to come in here as the person who's led that work on new financial powers so far. Thank you, Auditor General. Just to add to that, I think when we reported back in March, one of the things we were clear about was the need for the government to get to develop its thinking to an extent that it was able to assess the costs that, were ex that it was expected to require, recognising the link between decision making. Some decisions are still to be made, so, uh, some approaches are still to be determined, uh, and how that would affect the overall cost figures. We're clear that there's a need to establish a benchmark for the costs. There's a need for, need for government to uh, manage against that benchmark on an ongoing basis. But we also recognise as things happen, as decisions are made, there's a need to refine that and keep that under review. I think one of the things we'll be picking up as we look to our new piece of work is how that's played out in practice. One of the things that is apparent uh, is that the government has uh, moved things on since we last spoke, and I think that some of that work has been reflected in the estimates that have gone into the financial memorandum. But as the Auditor General says, I think there's still a lot more work to be done around the costs that uh, all this will incur, and so, uh, importantly, the management against those and uh, the, the value that's delivered out of that spending ultimately. Was how are we to understand that £190 million figure? And the answer that you're giving, is, 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 uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we should understand it as a benchmark. Um, uh, how has the benchmark been arrived at? I mean, why is it 190 and not 150 or you know, 390 or anything in between? Um, given that you know, we don't yet know very much about the agency, uh, we don't know where it will be, we don't know how many offices it will have, <laughs> We've been given estimates of its annual running costs. We've been given estimates of its uh, eventual um, staff size. Um, we don't know anything very much about the extent to which the new devolved benefits will be um, automated. Uh, Pauline McNeil has a question in the chamber later on uh, today about that. We might know a bit more about some of these things on Tuesday when the um, Minister for Social Security gives her next statement to the Parliament uh, 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 that might touch on a number of these issues. I don't know. I haven't seen it. But given the, all of the things that we know we don't know, how reliable is this 190 million figure? Good question, and I think it's one you genuinely need to direct to uh, colleagues in government. Um, I'm looking at our report on developing new financial powers from March, um, and one of our key recommendations there was that government needed to model more detailed costs, develop its plans and time, time scales for the um, implementation of the social security powers. Um, at the time we carried out that audit work, there wasn't enough for us to be able to comment on the robustness of the um, working assumptions that were in place. Um, that was six months ago now, um, the figure in the financial memorandum will have a basis in the work that's been done in Scottish Government and I think it's entirely appropriate for Parliament to test that through its committees um, with uh, the Government. 
our work will do that when we report back next spring. We're not in a position yet to give you that assurance. So you're not in a position to give us any assurance at all that this figure is robust. This is work that you know we have to just try and discover ourselves by asking asking the right questions of the right ministers at the right time. The the audit work that we did at the beginning of this year was looking at the um, Scottish government's circumstances at that time, and at that time we didn't feel the um, modelling of costs was detailed enough for us to be able to comment on it, and we recommended it needs to go further. So, so how, 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 can, how can we know that this figure, my final question, I mean, how, how, how can we know that this figure, and I don't mean to be pejorative, okay. but how, how can we know that this figure is anything more than just a guess? I think the, um, what the committee here and the Finance Committee can do at this stage is to ask the government about the basis on which the, the 190 million figure is put together with the assurance that we will be looking at that as part of our audit work and reporting back on it um, in May 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Paul McNeill, followed by George Adams, then Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. So I've been ploughing through all the lessons to be learned on ICT management. <laughs> And there are many. Um, so it seems to me that um, you don't really need to be ICT literate, but what's a common thread throughout is just basic management principles. That you have one team, that you talk to each other, there's governance and all of that. So, um, And you, you have the end users involved in it. Um, so, so far, in terms of the evidence we've heard from the Minister, Jean Freeman, um, a lot of that has already been planned for. We have 2,000 people that have a panel that the end users would make an input to, to the system. Um, but one of the things I picked up was that, in some cases, um, the use of short-term contracts, in some cases, led to problems with the ICT management systems. Um, would it be your view? Um, that the government should learn some lessons from, from that, from that. And, and of course who they employ. Um, maybe, I don't know if you're able to comment on whether you think we've got the expertise because the size of the project is probably bigger than anything I've read about so far. Absolutely right about the scale and complexity. Um, and as Morag has said, one of the continuing themes in our work on digital programmes has been about the importance of the right skills and experience and very often the lack of them or the, the poor use of them. Um, I know that the Scottish Government's <coughs> digital directorate has been um, working hard to fill both the short-term gaps and to develop longer-term capacity in government and across the public uh, services. Um, and I think the Chief Information Officer has re recently written to the P Public Audit Committee to update them on that and I understand you may have a copy of it it's certainly in the public domain and we can talk a bit more about it this morning if that would be helpful um, it's also entirely appropriate I think for big programs to make some use of contractor staff those the projects do have a, a sort of big hump of workload that needs to be accommodated and having staff in post to do that all the time would not be a good use of um, constrained public money one of the things we often see though is um, those teams not being well integrated with the program and policy staff and as more like I said that's critically important and secondly they're not being good plans for transferring their knowledge and experience in general but particularly of the system they're developing to the staff who will take on long-term responsibility for it. Um, so I think the two things about planning from the beginning about what skills and experience you'll need rather than trying to bring them on board in a rush because of very tight timescales and secondly planning for how you will transfer their experience back into the permanent staff are the two things that make that um, a good way of working rather than ad an additional risk in something that's already big and complex. Just a follow-up, I mean, you, I appreciate you might not be able to answer this, and it is a bit of a hot potato, about um, where the new agency would be located, so I'm not trying to draw you into that, but um, given the size of the project, so obviously there's, as you said, planning at the early stages, which would be now, and then there's the establishment of the agency itself, so presumably the planning and the management will go into the start date as well, and I wondered, does it matter where it is located in the sense that where you might draw your skills from at that point? Um, in some ways, that decision is a policy decision, and that's, that's one that I'm therefore um, precluded from commenting on for, for good reasons. Um, but you're absolutely right. I would expect that when the government is making decisions, it will be thinking about where it will have access to the skills it, need, it needs, and also about interactions with other parts of the public sector. Mark may want to comment on that, given his, his thinking on the broader social security programme. 
I think I think that I think the the short answer is there's a range of factors in that decision, uh, and uh, that the one of the policy decisions the government made, makes to make is how to balance those range of factors, whether it's access to skills uh, and, and access to a workforce, uh, and, uh, and and as one of the number of factors that uh, I'm sure it will be considering in its overall decision. Can I get back in? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. George Adams, you want to just come in? I would just like, you've, you've highlighted the fact that obviously the complexity of the whole scenario and uh, the, the thing we've, we've highlighted that as a committee as well because there isn't a big red button. Can't press it. I've said that on numerous occasions. People just want to know when their benefit money gets in their account and they want to see a seamless transition from one to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but to get it right, I've, I've looked at your uh, report here you've got from May and uh, your five principles for success. It's a handy wee infographic in, in page five. Now, having worked in the real world in an industry that loved infographics but didn't necessarily read them all, all the time and abide by them, I would just ask that in your... Uh, uh, dealings and expertise on this. Have the Scottish Government uh, worked towards currently these five principles that you've, uh, you've set out here so that when it comes to the day, we don't have any issues? I'd say it's work in progress. We produce this briefing paper, as I think the committee knows, because we have um, reported on a number of different IT programmes that haven't succeeded um, to varying degrees of importance. Um, and we thought in terms of helping people to learn from that, pulling it together would be useful. Um, I know the government is taking this very seriously. Uh, the Scottish Government has recently given evidence to the Public Audit Committee on um, the progress it's making in the, the sort of underlying changes that are needed to be able to do this better. And equally, I think we all recognise there's no quick fix. Um, so uh, we, we continue to look in the specific programmes that we audit at the way these are being uh, delivered and we very much welcome this committee's early interest in how that's going um, but I'm also very conscious that as Miss McNeil said earlier um, often the things that go wrong are actually the common sense things that you would expect to be there all the time um, human beings organizations aren't perfect things don't work as planned um, and it, it is often the softer things around culture, around leadership, that, that make the biggest difference. Um, so I think the reason for the reports that we've produced so far are, first of all, recognising that progress is happening, but also recognising the complexity and scale of this, and, as you've said, the potential to have real impacts on people's lives and often the most vulnerable people in Scotland. You, you said in previous programmes that uh, everything happened early on at the planning stage. Now, from what we've seen, uh, there seems to be a an openness from the government to say, right, we need to get this right at this stage. Do you believe there's been the correct interaction with different organisations, like you've already said, both in-house and externally, to try and make sure that we've addressed that situation? In, in the March report on the new financial powers, we talk about the good start that's been made. Um, but I, I think all I can do really is to reflect again, first of all, the unprecedented scale and complexity of this. And secondly, that even starting as early as the government can start, the timescales are still short. And that's unavoidable given the timescales that have been agreed for the transfer of powers. Um, but it, there is no doubt this is a very significant challenge for, for government. But you know one, just in the, uh, the complexity is the fact that we've already heard that it's over about three or four different computer systems that don't talk to each other, plus some of it uh, is actually on a manual system in some undisclosed uh, place uh, down south. You know, so uh, that adds to the complexity in trying to get all that together. So uh, at this stage, uh, do you believe the Scottish Government have stuck with the five principles but made sure that uh, they're working towards make sure that we don't have the difficulties at a later date because of the sheer complexities and the fact that the information, the data alone is uh, a major issue. Um, with the caveat that I used in my answer to Mr Tompkins earlier, we said in the March report we thought they had made a good start with this. But the sorts of examples you're talking about really do highlight how complex it is. Um, and until we've done the next round of audit work, I don't feel I can give very much more assurance of, around um, what we're seeing. Mark, is there anything you want to add in that context? I think, no, I think the one thing that I would add is that what we, what we saw in March and what we've seen since then is a commitment from the programme to learn lessons from other systems. So we talk a little in the March report about that, and I know information been shared with you since then about the number of organisations that the government have spoken with to understand <coughs> and learn those lessons and we're, we're optimistic about that but yet to be convinced. Okay. Alison Johnson. <coughs> Hi, Hi, Dean. Dean. 
Um, the theme of the need to, make, to ensure that we have the correct skills and experience and expertise is coming up time and time again. I'm just wondering how much scrutiny you think we as a committee need to place on that, because while we're discussing principles and relationships with the UK government and so on, if, if this isn't delivered properly, it will have devastating consequences for, really, for millions of people. So I just wonder if you could um, elaborate a little on where you believe we are at the moment. Um, I mean, I think we're going to be making, the Scottish Government will be making more payments in a week than it currently does in a year. So how do we make that leap and ensure that it's made successfully? Um, it, there's, no, there's no simple one answer to that. Um, it might be helpful if I talk you through what we will be looking at in our audit work, because I suspect there will be strong parallels with, with what you'll be interested in as a Social Security Committee. Um, we, we will be looking closely at the plans which the government is putting in place, both the overall programme and the detailed plans for the individual work streams within that, and testing them to make sure that we think they're realistic, that the interdependencies are taken account of, that they're doable within the capacity of a, a civil service which is smaller now than it was 10 years ago and where there are a number of other pressures on people's times for, for good and well-known reasons. Um, we'll be looking at the way in which they're modelling the costs of what they're intending to do um, and thinking about not just the, the cost of this programme but where it sits within the overall um, financial envelope as we move into a new world where the Scottish Government will be raising about half of what it spends with the associated volatility and uncertainty that comes with that. Um, and we'll be looking critically at the people aspects, both the leadership of it and the, the, sense, the extent to which people are making choices about priorities um, and working those through their plans but also making sure the right people with the right skills are in place um, and are being supported to do what's needed on a long-term basis. Um, one of the factors we're very conscious of around the Cap Futures programme, which has been another big area of interest for us, is the, the long-term strain on people as they've been trying to recover from the situation that became apparent a couple of years ago. Um, and there's a, a, there's a huge uh, commitment being shown that's admirable and um, should be recognised, but it's not a way you can and expect people to work indefinitely. Equally, in this programme, we know people are going to be working very hard to meet the 2021 timescale for full transfer. People need to be thinking both about having the right skills in place and also making sure that that is developing a workforce that can do this longer term and um, be building expertise and experience over that period rather than running the risk of burning people out um, to meet very short time scales. Um, we don't see any evidence that's happening now, but it's one of the things we'll be looking for, again, that sense of sustainability as we look ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Jamie <coughs> Valfe, you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and thank you very much, Auditor General. I suppose, and maybe I've just been around too long, um, both in local government, both within NHS, within, we have lots of reports of lessons learned, and yet we seem to always still then fall back and often make the same mistakes. Um, and I think all parts of local, national, um, and other organisations, how <coughs> would you say the best way for this committee and carry on from Alison Johnson's point, to scrutinise this, to make sure that we do not make the same mistakes that have been made in previous projects. And is there something endemic within local and national government that makes this happen? Or is it something that also happens within the private sector as well? Um, starting with your last question first, because it's the easiest one, I think there's no doubt this happens in the private sector as well as in the public sector. Um, we've all seen um, both uh, very visible failings in banking over the last few years and read the articles that suggest that most banks um, still have a, a sort of deficit to make up in terms of the robustness and the resilience of their IT systems that we all depend on daily. So this isn't by any means just about the public sector and the skills that are needed are in scarce supply right across the economy. Um, in terms of what this committee might be looking for, um, I'm not sure there's very much we can add to the answer that we've given to um, Ms Johnston a moment ago, um, other than to say that I think perhaps uh, starting to develop some, some clear sort of shared expectations with government about what you're interested in and the frequency with which they, they will be sharing that information with you is a good starting point, um, with the, the sort of backup that we will be reporting regularly on this, um, actually at a couple of points a year, <coughs> 
one in the spring update on the new financial powers more generally, and we know Social Security will be an increasingly big part of that. And secondly, in the annual report I do on the Scottish Government's accounts, which pulls out significant things that have come out of the audit each year, which tends to be in the autumn. The next one's due um, towards the end of this month, early October. Um, so you'll be getting assurance from us twice a year about the problems that we're seeing, but I think agreeing with government what you expect to see and how they will provide that with you on a regular basis, not so frequent that you're constantly sort of pulling it up by the roots to have a look, but regularly enough that you would pick up signs if things were going off track before it was too late to do anything about it, I think would be a good um, starting point for this committee scrutiny. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Auditor General, for, for answering the questions as usual so succinctly. And thank you, Moraga and, and Mark, as well, uh, for, for answering too. Uh, we will now move into private session. Thank you. Thank you.